Hello and welcome back to Rebound with Resilience, a podcast dedicated to raise your resilience mindset and mental wellness. And today I am actually very humbled and honored to have me a guest today. Uh, his story really, I have no words to describe it. Uh, and, and it's very hard to describe it. I'll, I'll just leave the podcast to do the talking. In fact, I am, you know, I just want to introduce him real quick. You know, before I, I give a recount of his story, but I just want to ask Takala to say hello. Hi, Takala. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Takala and welcome. I mean, I really thank for this opportunity to share my experience with you. And I hope that I can help to enlighten you on the power of the mind and how we can conquer odds. Just like thank I you. did. Thank you so much. I mean, that... Well, wow, just the introduction alone, I'm already getting excited to listen to you. Uh, we will talk about the power of the mind for sure. Uh, in fact, Takala in Malay it stands for Khan Luz, right? It's not your birth name, but it's a name that you picked up along the way. And I think it exemplifies your story and the resilience that you exemplify. Lah. So I think for those of you that don't know Takala's story, uh, just allow me, Takala, to just give an introduction or just a recount of your story and how I got to know about you as well. Yeah, so it was actually last year, this guy called Minion Man on Twitter. I think you you went up, he, he, basically the color story went viral on Twitter last year. And it was this guy called Minion Man. I think you complimented him on his shirt, right? Was it in an MRT where you went up and you complimented him on your shirt? You know, I think you do that often, right? So you, you did that. And then I think he mentioned that initially he was a bit weary, but he stayed back. He gave you time to, to talk to you and he was very glad that he did, right? And he actually recounted your story fully on Twitter. And this was actually what he said. You know, he said at the end, the last tweet, he said that this man started our conversation by telling me he only had half his brain left to lose half a brain to an accident and still have the heart and resolve of two men. Takara Tan's story is humanity at his finest. God bless. So I think he really inspired that particular individual and not just him, but there were thousands and thousands of reshares, you know, just sharing from your story and just give me some time to recount your story. So I think in 1994, that was actually the year that I was born in. 1994, you were at the peak of your career or life. You were a commando, a triathlete. You even ran a 100km race and you were going to start a job at PNG. So you beat out 7,000 applicants to get a job at PNG. So on 24th May, uh, 1994, you were sending your then girlfriend back from dinner. And on the way back home, you met with an accident where you were flung almost 70 meters from your motorcycle. Uh, the motorcycle split into half and you met with a very severe accident uh, whereby your you, you mentioned that your brain was, or your head was hit and it was like porcelain being shattered, held together by flesh. That's the analogy that you gave. When I read that, I, I was at chills. Yeah, um, and of course, the months following which was extremely difficult, the doctors gave you 0.1% chance of survival, but you went through multiple surgeries, you recovered, uh, you took a long journey to recovery, and right now you're living life to the fullest. You know, and even giving talks once in a while as well to inspire people. So, um, yeah, that, that is your story in a nutshell. But with, with all, I mean, I'm sure the listeners and myself are looking, want to know more about um, just the full story. Uh, could I ask, right, need you just to share um, the recount of that incident? And, you know, when you first awoke in the hospital, right, what actually came to your mind? Okay, maybe what I can do is I can start off by telling you my, my life experience from young. Sure. So what I can, what, what can been referred to me or I can recall. Sure. I started off as a frail young kid. You know, imagine when I'm young, I was born with asthma. So I was okay. thin and frail. And my brothers, they are all healthy, you know, muscular. Both of them became dragon boaters, canoeists, whereas I was thin and fit, I was frail. And mm. what I learned along the way is that each have their own forte. For okay. me, just a passing fad. And I grew out of it. I became a cross-country runner mm. and a school and follow on to become a commando. And I did the triathlon. Just now I mentioned marathon, 100 kilometer. No, it's yeah. a triathlon. Okay. I spent to Blaubin, came back, did a 
60 kilometers cycling and just right. boom, stop thereafter. Okay. okay. Oh, it's it's Iron Man. Uh. You did Iron Man. Half Iron Man. Okay. Kilometer triathlon. Okay. I came in Singapore 36th position. Okay. And commando triathlon, I came in 7th position. Okay. And a separate event. So, this realization of my forte helped me to be more confident. And when I graduated from university in the final year, I actually took up the job interview for Procter & Gamble. I'm actually a mechanical engineering student, but I chose to go into sales and marketing. I guess because I know I have the clip of the tongue. Therefore, mm. I want to make good use of it. Doing sales marketing is the correct avenue for me to venture into the working force. Mm. And I managed to clinch the job. Across, I think it's a six-layer interview. Sure. The number of people I mentioned, I managed to defeat them and clinch the best area, CBD, under my charge. And okay. at the point of time, at the prime of my life, you no, know, we just had a holiday with our friends in you know, Australia. And I was with my girlfriend most of the time. That night, we actually had a very good dinner to confirm our relationship. And when after I sent her home, I lighted her, I kissed her goodnight. I entered the expressway without tying my helmet. Mm. Imagine, I was at my prime of my life. I was so mm. happy. But, but when I entered the expressway, I didn't know that there's a vehicle, a police vehicle parked on the right lane, just over the summit of the expressway mm. from Bukit Bato in the PIE in the easterly direction. Mm. Just when you can go over the summit of the expressway, you can see Nian Poly, the police vehicle appeared in front of me. I had no choice but to be a right. For myself, I was traveling about 100 km per hour. So speed was my error. Mm. But my handlebar actually scratched on the door, the front wheel turned, and it became a pivot point because it broke mm -hmm. right. a pivot point. So my whole bike flew up. My body was catapulted 70 meters away. Mm -hmm. And my bike actually broke. It did not break into two, but the chassis broke. So it can no longer be repaired. Mm -hmm. My face actually landed onto the floor and that actually helped absorb the impact. The fracture of my face absorbed the impact. The the, right. So that doesn't rebound. And mm -hmm. then... Uh, Saving grace. Right. Okay. Yeah. My nose got torn off, my eye got blinded, my, my head didn't rebound, and so my spine didn't break. That's why I didn't suffer paralysis of my body. Mm. Yeah. And my nose was dragged, my face was dragged, and so my nose was torn off. Mm. It depends when they came to save me. They came in really fast. You know why? Because their dispatch point was in Bukibato, uh, is in Bukibato, and mm. the police them straight away in five minutes they arrived. They yeah. chose to hunt for my nostril. So my left nose was left on the road and they rushed me to hospital straight away. Yeah. Mm. Defense, and they told their colleague and the colleague told me, when they found me, they found a lot of water surrounding my head on the floor. That happens to me by neural fluid. Mm. Neural fluid, can you imagine how serious it is? Good or bad? Yeah, it's been good. It is good. Okay. Because the discharge of the neural fluid prevent my brain from being suffocated. Mm. So what, what they need to do was to handle myself carefully, put on a stretcher and rush me to NUH, the nearest hospital with neuro department available. Okay. So that's why my life was saved because of their immediate contingent action. Okay. It's about learning to know what weighs the pros and cons and make the best choice available. So mm -hmm. it's about very attentive and elevated in perspective to understand the who, what, where, and why, and make the rationally best decision rather mm. than go by bias, be narrow-minded. Yeah, yeah. We we'll talk about that later because you did share me about elevated perspective. That is very striking to me. I want to give more time to really explore that in detail. Uh, but moving, of course, carrying on with the story. But right? I mean, you were rushed to the hospital. Of course, this is all in hindsight. Right? You don't remember all of this happening. Yeah. Um, and and you. When you woke up after a coma, how long was it that you were in a, in a coma? I was in coma. I, I ended in the hospital in coma, but my coma was extended by two weeks. Because okay. my face was shattered, movement would cause my brain to scratch on my shattered bone. The doctor actually had, uh, the neurosurgeon, to save my life, the, the neurosurgeon got to make a choice to do both my head and my leg because my leg was broken and shortened by one half inch. Do okay. they repair over the same time? Or do they forego the leg to save the brain? They mm -hmm. made the right decision to forego my leg 
and save my brain. In two weeks in the ICU, they had to open up my skull seven times. Each, I think, once open up whole, just take turns to remove yeah. the blood clot that rests onto my brain. Because mm-hmm. I have a broken vessel that was too small to stitch. The doctor have no choice but to pray for me. So mm-hmm. sometimes you have to pray, even mm-hmm. in uh, such situation, never give up hope. Yeah. Sure. So after the seven try in removal of the blood, the vessel healed by itself. Wow. The broken vessel mm-hmm. healed by itself. And so the doctor okay. could focus on the retention of my life and the repair of my body after that. Yeah. I think sometimes you don't give enough credit to neurosurgeons. I mean, it's a very specialized field of, mm. of work that uh, it's quite amazing what the work that they do and surgeries that you perform. And, yeah. and of course, I wouldn't be able to understand the technicalities of it. But mm. I guess could you give uh, maybe an analogy of what was happening and how, like you mentioned, you lost half of your brain. Right? What, what, how was it like the analogy? Yeah. When you say, when I say I lost half of my brain, yeah. It's actually the heart disk space. I okay. lost half of my heart disk space okay. and that includes all my experiential memory. I see. So I'm left with half a heart disk that is empty. Mm. So I couldn't talk. I couldn't remember the past. To me, everything is new. I'm like a newborn baby. At age of 24, I have to start learning all over again. Mm. And- okay. So when you first, you know, how, how was that, that journey for you? You know, having, when you woke up eventually from your coma, you couldn't recognize anyone around you. Was it, do you remember that moment or was it a blur at that point? I guess I was like a newborn baby. Okay. A newborn baby would be more like receiving information. Ah, receiving information. Okay. Yeah. And not making judgment. Sure. Not making judgment. So my recovery, three months in the hospital, I don't recall at all. Mm. Is go back home. I have to ask questions to find out more. Yeah. Okay. And only when home, I start to realize. I start to think. I start to strategize. I start to mm. analyze the situation when I was at home, where I could browse through my belonging. Because when I got home, first thing my mom told me is, was rather, mm. all the things I shoved them into the cabinet. Go through them and find out about yourself. Mm. I was all, oh, okay, I'll do just that. So when I went through my belonging, I saw my photographs. Mm. I had a lot of questions. And so I asked questions. Mm. And to improve my ability to ask, I listened to media to learn. I listened to radio to learn Mandarin. And mm. I learned a bit at a time. Oh, sure, okay. And back during, during that period of time as well, you, your dad, your dad also had, during the time when you're recovering in the hospital, mm-hmm. your dad forgot heart bypass surgery yeah. because he... It was yeah. shocked. You know, when they heard of my accident at home, my mom cried at the dining table once she heard from the police. My dad was watching the news. Upon hearing my accident, he actually collapsed on a chair with his arms in the air and cried out loud. Why must it be my son? Mm. My mom told me about this, I was quite surprised because I didn't know my dad loved me so much. The mm-hmm. little I remember are the things in the past of his mis- misdeeds, whatever. But what happened is that my dad was most proud of me because of yeah. me and my siblings, I'm the most hardworking in studies and I was able to do well in my studies. Okay. Graduate with a degree. Okay. So... Over a um, defense bomb shelter, I was the one who was assigned to project to test the ventilation system the bomb shelter with my group of friends, and we did help our country in that aspect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did read about that. That is quite an amazing achievement. It's like an innovation that you came up with that was first of its kind, that was quite innovative at that stage. Yeah, yeah. there's another one is the impact tester of concrete. To mm. me and my friend, we actually designed an impact tester of concrete to improve the results accuracy right From plus minus 20 percent we reduce it to plus minus one percent standard deviation wow yeah you see as students we can and with the advice of our lecturers do experiments to come out with new ideas mm. okay. yeah yeah um so so uh, you know your dad loved you so much but he loved you in fact he loved you so much that he forgot his heart bypass to 
to yes. uh, care so that he didn't want your family to shut go between two hospitals. Mm. So because of that, he did not take the surgery and mm. that led him to eventually pass away in his sleep. My dad didn't want my family to run between two hospitals. So yeah. he put me as a priority. So I am indeed deeply touched. Okay. And I feel guilty because of me, he passed away in his sleep. Mm. And for his heart bypass surgery, there is 90 over percent chance that he will be okay. Mm. Yeah. I believe okay. so by statistics. Sure. And he, he passed away. And during the funeral, you did share that. You asked your mom, why is that holding on to, why is your brother holding on to someone else's photo? You couldn't recognize your dad. And your mom broke down. I don't know why it's death. I do not know why it's death. So at the funeral, mm. I attended the funeral. They put me on a wheelchair to attend the funeral. I saw my brother holding my dad's photograph. Mm. I just couldn't comprehend what was it for. So I questioned my mom. And my mom, she couldn't answer me. She was so sad, she broke down into tears. So only three months later, I get to find out, I got to find out that my dad died because of me. That created in me a great sense of guilt. And because of that, I almost gave up my life. Yeah, you shared that you had suicidal thoughts, right? Could you share more, more about that? Yeah. I, I didn't want to live on as a burden to my family member because my situation was so hopeless and helpless. My loss of memory, my blinded eye, my loss of sense of smell, my loss of the retention ability, memory retention ability, my childishness, my lack of language, my broken leg, shortened by one half inch, my dislocated shoulder, I was putting on weight because mm. I couldn't exercise much. That would imply that I may become a long-term burden for my family. Okay. So I told myself, if I cannot recover, then I should not prolong the suffering of my family member. I should just leave. And for them, they may be sad for a while. But after that, after a, time, a bit of time, they will forget. Yeah, and life will go on like normal. Mm. With this thought in mind, I actually engineered how to commit suicide. I planned to jump from nine story with plates on my hand. Because I thought if I don't have a control element, I may over rotate my body and end up the leg hit the floor, I may become worse, um, more disabled. Mm. And so I plan to carry plates on each hand, a plate on each hand to have aileron effect, to create pressure differential that will become a force, a distance from my body central or gravity, it becomes a lever system. Mm. And with this ability to think, can you imagine I could engineer my death? Why not engineer my survival? I, as I contemplate on suicide, I paused for a moment and I went about with my life and consider otherwise. One day at a brain injury support group activity, I got to see that, hey man, there are many other brain injured people worse off than me. Some of them do lose their ability to balance. Some of them, they have cognitive deduction disability. Whereas for me, my CPU is still functional. And I got to see a neighbor who is, who was at a part of time, I guess, semi-lateral paralyzed. You know, when I was thinking about suicide, I went to ground level, stroll about. I met him sitting in a chair, I sat beside him. I saw him holding a walking stick. Then I told him, I think it's lunchtime. Do you need me to help you home? He pointed up the stairs. And so I brought him home. Mm. Later I learned from his mom that six years before that day, he had an accident with a bus, fractured his spine, became semi-lateral paralyzed. Eating one meal a day, for, for, for your information, he's uh, like a vegetable because he mm. lost his ability. Eating one meal a day, he actually put on a lot of weight. And for me, at the point of time, my weight would be around 76 kilograms, mm. which is, again, uh, not that good, given okay. that it's fat and not muscle. So I saw how he's more unfortunate than me, and the other brain injured people are more unfortunate than me. And I got to see a picture at Peace Center that shows a lighted beacon in troubled water. Mm. I felt emboldened that, hey, that lighted beacon is me. I am supposed to shed light that when there's a will, there'll be a way. That life can be better. 
that you can meander along a suitable trail based on your consideration of the factors available and make good use of every situation. So with this, I, it empowered me to stand up again. Okay. That's how I became a teacher. Yeah. yeah. And also a brain injury society and etc. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was the turning point where you saw that became a metaphor for your life. You wanted yeah. to rebuild it. So the sweet side of thoughts just went back, you know, into the recesses and you, you didn't think about that anymore. Correct. And then you started... A motivator for him. Uh, I, I visited that neighbor a couple yeah. of times. Uh, I see. Right. Okay. And it is there that I get to see how fortunate I am. I see. Okay. So from there, you took steps, you know. For, I mean, for you to say that is very striking because, you know, you know, on the surface, at least for someone looking, at least just on the surface, right? For you to say you are fortunate is, yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't think that's the first thing that comes to their mind. But the fact that you are saying it now. One yeah. word that is very important that I've not shared earlier on is the word con, C-O-N. Mm. You know what's the word con? It's a lie? No, not just that. Con, convince, confuse, conjure. Use the right con at the right time. So it again, it's about case management. At this mm. moment, under this scenario, what do I need to do? Do I want to convince myself? Do I want to confuse myself? Or sometimes in certain situations, if you confuse yourself, you can become more inquisitive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Other than, uh, like that. Yeah. Yeah, right? nah. So yeah. it's about choice thing and choice theory. Mm. Oh, to do yes, under yes. the situation. I read about that as well. Choice uh, theory is interesting. Uh, I have a book. Uh, just... <laughs> you have a book. But yeah, we didn't go there, right? Uh, yeah. be- Go into that, or because before we talk about it, sure. Let me tell you what I found in my cabinet when my mom said, "Go through your belongings." I found that I wrote poems, mm. and poem I wrote when I was in secondary school predicted my accident will happen. Mm. Can you recite the poem. Yeah, sure. I wrote this when I was around fifteen years old. Against the wind. Older, but no wiser, I still find myself inextricably, unavoidably, running against the wind. Whilst it could have been easier, rowing with the tide, something within me beckons. Do it otherwise. Define instincts, rejecting the norms, living my life on its edge. I refused to conform. Perhaps one day, just one fine day, when my time is done. Laid down to oblivion. My life has just begun. Can you imagine? I wrote this when I was 15 years old. And now, nine years later, after my accident, I get to read it in my, on my scribbled writing in my cabinet. From, I found it in my cabinet. I set up right. And I said, oh, it's not the end. It's a new beginning. And so I need to know my direction oh. in life. That prompted me to buy a compass to attach to my watch to remind myself, Takala, carefully navigate. That embodiment I bought from Army Market on my watch became a direction finder for me. Because a lot of people, they are lost. Why? Mm. They choose to be lost. Mm. But after I lost my memory, I choose to use this kind of physical reminder to get me to get my direction right. That's why when I join organization like Toastmaster to learn how to talk, I know that's the right thing to do. I dedicate my time and effort into it. And joining the brain injury support group, head injury support group, it gives me the time to contribute to those worse off than me, as well as inspire their family members. Sure. And also bring a lot of joy to the medical professional who are looking for ways other ways other than medical provision to help the survivors of brain injury. Sure. Okay. Oh my God, I had chills listening to, to your story. I, I think I must imagine that when you first looked at it, you really work, you really like that foreshadowing and you know, I, you must have really woke you up in that. Because it's such a, the poem is not, it's like for 15 year old to write that, it's actually a very deep poem. It's not, it's very deep. Yeah. I, I guess because it is myself, I love to take a risk. I love mm. to take I even dare to climb coconut tree with a scout belt that is so yeah. dangerous and precarious. 
yeah, wrap around the waist to hobble up the coconut tree. I became a scuba diver, a rock climber, and mm. I I, mean, I did a lot of flying fox game. I mean, okay. it is just uh, my life is on the edge, and sure. the accident I guess is a wake up call. The accident is a wake up call. Okay, and with that compass in your hand, with the navigation, with that purpose, you went on to do a couple of things, right? You went to work in a dim sum store first, mm. and then you went to work in Rita Singapore, and oh, exactly. eventually. Yeah, right. became a, a relief teacher for six years. Also, um, yeah. I taught in school for three, three oh, plus. Yeah, uh, six I years after your incident, you then I became a teacher. Yeah. Okay. How's the experience being a teacher like? I, I knew you were you were doing well, and in fact, you know the funny thing is that I put it on my Instagram that I'm actually interviewing you. One of my followers actually said that he was taught by you before. <laughs> <laughs> That's in Evergreen what? Secondary. Yes. Yeah. Evergreen yeah. Is yeah. A, I was assigned to because it's close to my home. I stay at uh, Admiralty area. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, um, initially, I taught the express student, but I guess they found that I'm more suitable for teaching normal technical. That's mm -hmm. why I taught the normal technical. I became very much like a nanny. And I understand these children, what they need is management. Because mm -hmm. every student comes from a background that may be lacking in certain aspects. So these right. students need to be nurtured each on, on their own aspect. That's why I would, I would teach them action dance in class. Oh. It's all building up the camaraderie. And when you see them unify together to do action dance, watashi, when they do it together in unison, there is such strength and prowess. And I'm glad, I'm glad that my students are very well behaved, even though normally the normal tech students will be more rowdy. Yeah. I guess... Um, yeah, because they have a nanny who will cry for them if they were to hurt me. <laughs> yeah, I, I must imagine you must be an amazing teacher that touched so many lives. But you did tell me that after a while, you had to let go of that because you couldn't remember the names. And was, mm -hmm. was it the reason or was there other reasons why you left? Because I have a friend who actually wanted to go to Australia to practice in dentistry. Okay. And so he asked me whether I'd like to join him because I can go to Australia to learn more about brain injury oh, and play an active role in helping the community in that right. aspect as a social science expert. So yeah. I actually resigned from, te I talked to my family member and conceded that you know, it's a good decision. So I resigned from teaching and flew to Australia, Melbourne, Victoria to actually mm. do a degree course or postgraduate degree, a postgraduate diploma, you call it, in La Trobe University. Uh, I see. How was the experience for you? Great, great. I stayed there for three years. First year, I completed a course. When I was there, I get to um, learn a lot of things. And I get to see diverse experiences. And to be alone in the environment, I get to start to meander and you know, live life by myself. And meet up with people whom I can imagine so amazing. I, I rented a room from a China girl. Her parents actually didn't allow me to rent from her. And so she had to ask me to leave. And while walking dejected on the road, I get to meet up with a Greek family who need money. And so they were selling secondhand goods. So when I saw something suitable for myself, I asked the man, 70-year-old man, how much are these? He looked at me and said, son, something seems to be bothering you. What is it? Tell me. Can you imagine in Australia? Yeah. Oh, a stranger. I, I do not even know him. I'm yeah. a stranger. And he wants to know my problem. You can hardly find this in other places like Singapore. Mm -hmm. And so... What I did was that I told him, and upon hearing my dire straits, or right, my accommodation dilemma, he actually shouted to his wife, darling, clean up our granddaughter's room for this gentleman. He needs a place to stay. And normally, the madame, I thought they would, huh? Why, huh? Yeah, Why? insane. No, no one in Singapore. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm making a big statement, but I guess it's not as common. But she yeah. said, okay. Imagine the, okay. Yeah. <laughs> she went to the granddaughter's room for <laughs> Called and straight away prepared it for me to stay. Wow, my heart melted. So, this is what we call unconditional love. They helped me without asking what they can get from it. Mm. I stayed there for two weeks. In the two weeks, I got, I, I got to see true unconditional love, and I got to see the two of them battling with their own challenges. The man actually survived from full body paralysis he had when he was 40 plus. He had stroke, his whole body was paralyzed. And his wife is a diabetic. And yet at the age of 70, they had to work in a restaurant on the weekends 
to earn money to pay for their son's medication. Their son slipped and fell at the pool side and became disabled. And what medication he takes, the government does not subsidize. So can you imagine two ill people working hard to support their ill son? And they, let, and they let you in. Yeah, and they let me in unconditionally. Wow. Can you imagine? I, it really touched me greatly. And I, I think this is something we need to garner. That is the emotional expression. Yeah. And the loving kindness, the compassionate heart mindset, the inclusiveness, integrity, rather than the calculative self, selfishness. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Nakala. That story, I mean, I have no words to describe how much it, it, it touched me. Uh, and, and I know that's one of the reasons why you are also a very abundant and loving person. Uh, and I, I, you know, I think we can, you know, I, in fact, included one segment just for that, talking about your perspective. And, you know, I, I guess after you came back from, from Australia, you know, you went on to um, do, uh, how, and how do you end up in the current work there? Before we go into more yeah. of the focus. Yeah. 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 I can talk about another thing in Australia. Sure. In Australia, I get to attend the sixth world, I get, I got to attend the sixth world congress on brain injury. Mm. Can you imagine right now is already the, how many congress already, but when yeah. you know, I was in Australia, it was the sixth world congress. I got to mingle with a group of people who are affected by brain injury from all around the world. They gather there and we get to talk and share about each other's experiences. Mm. And Japan, Japan, in Japan, there are many brain injured people. And so when we hear from such uh, sharing, we get to see that we are not alone. Brain injury is a very, very existential phenomenon that society worldwide need to learn to include in consideration. Okay. Perhaps I can read you another poem I wrote when I was 16 years old in junior college first oh, year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was it a nightmare or was it reality? I asked myself. I entered half conscious what was happening, gradually opening my eyes to sense and to react. It was at first like Eden the Roses on the summit of Olympia, the very pinnacle of mankind. But the thorns hurt not just me, but all who embraces it. My mind still burns with sad memory until death or they part. But stand up I will, because upon me is burst out the roar, not many can part it, and this I know. I would do to my very last breath. I wrote this when I was 16 years old, one year after the earlier poem. Mm. This is about partaking a role and not throwing it away or putting it aside. It's about finding out what you can do to contribute for the good of the community. And when you do it, your heart will be open. Sure. You'll be able to ascend. Wow. Matakala, you really deserve a bigger platform. You know, I wish my podcast was a bit bigger. It's not the biggest podcast, but uh, okay. it's, a, it's a start, you know. I, I, uh, I'll I do my best to refer you to to, to film platforms that I think might be interested to feature you because I feel that your story needs to be told and your, your passion and your conviction can help so many more people. Um, Fine, another yeah. bridge. You are a bridge. Yeah. Bridging my experience to more people. That's good. That's good. Keep it thank up. You. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, it's uh, humble by that. Um, one more thing is my, my leg actually fractured and shortened by one half inch. Yeah. And guess what happened? My mom complained to the doctor that I limp badly. So you see, my mom has a right to complain. Mm -hmm. And my mom did it. And the doctor took heat. And they used me as a specimen to teach the NUS undergrad how to amputate, to elongate using a Russian technique that was probably designed in the 1970s or so. And so they tried it out on my leg, demonstrating to the student. I had my spine injected epidural jab so that my lower half of my body, there's no sensation. So can you imagine they cut my leg apart with me conscious? but I don't feel a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the sad thing is I don't get to see it. And oh. after they took away the blind, I get to see a metal frame fixed to my leg. They drilled right through my bone. 
to fix a frame above and below with my tibia fibula amputated, held firmly using a frame. So every day I had to turn the nut four times, each time quarter of a millimeter. And in one and a half month, I got back my walking age. And okay. following that, another one and a half month, for it to fuse. After that, mm. they plugged the frame. They had, to, they had to do it with me unconscious because mm. it was a really rough experience, yeah, yeah. I guess. After that, within a year, I could run the full marathon with my elongated leg. When there's a will, there will be a way. I didn't have to train much for it. I only did three practice, short distance practice. The longest was about maybe eight kilometer before I went to full marathon. But when I got to the beginning of the marathon, I looked out for what? Not pretty girls. I looked out for a potential buddy. I saw a senior gentleman wearing new attire telling me that, hey, this guy got not much experience. So I just suggested to him, hello, sure. how about we be buddy? He said, okay, law. And so we ran together took turns to lead in front. And we could have our horse at the drink station, even chat with the girls who serve us drinks. But came to the last half a kilometer, he told me while running, Takala, I think I can do the rest on my own. I said, by all means. So he ended the run probably about two, three minutes in front of me. But I know that if I had not his help, I would not have completed the full marathon within eight hours. Therefore, grateful I am. When, we, when I entered the marathon, he was there waiting for me to congratulate me and me doing the same to him. So it's not about being in front. It's about helping each other to be the best that we can be. Isn't it? Mm. Victory is over yourself, not over others. Ah. Okay. Um, I would like to transition and talk about, you know, your your resilience, your purpose, and your perspective. You know, I just want to ask, like, what are the core mindsets of factors, if you want, to, whatever you want to call it, that you derive strength from, especially after you face the incident? How, what was is there a core philosophy that you hold by and guide you? Okay, one thing is I never allow myself to jump the gun to let my animal animal instinct take action. I learned to hold myself, step back, and look at the scenario using looking at myself as a second party, mm. the other third parties. And I asked, what is everyone thinking? I learned to stand in the shoes of the beholder, understand their viewpoint. Okay. And therefore, we can rationally better engage everyone, include everyone's perspective, and engineer the best solution. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's not a one man's game, it's a many man's game, many a time. Yeah. Even in a relationship between two persons, there could be many other people that are involved, family members, friends, children, career work, boss, teammates. Yeah. So it's about holding your horses. Yeah, that's very important. Mm. <laughs> I was always thinking of reining the horse back. Yeah. Or Okay, let's pause and consider what is the best way sure. to resolve this problem. Okay. I actually talk about that a lot as well, like responding and not reacting because the animal brain will react and go through the same mm. um, emotions as complex. Um, that maybe is quite an uh, important experience. About mm. a month after I got home, after the accident, there was a night at 11 p.m. when my two brothers and my mom were reprimanding me at 11 p.m. Can you imagine? Mm. A brain injured, I'm disabled. Mm. And them were reprimanding me because I didn't follow the order, I do things in a different ways, mm. way, etc. So what happened was that when they were reprimanding me, I looked at them with joy. Ah, oh, they love me. That's why they bother to be yeah. concerned about me. So mm. I smiled. And after I smiled, I didn't open my mouth to say a single word. I turned around to the main door. I walked to the main door, opened it, and I went out for a two kilometer stroll hobbling about in Amokyo Avenue 10 area. Mm. It was peaceful and calm for me. And I came back energized, clear in the mind. My younger brother came up to me and said, sorry, bro, sorry for what we did. Mm. Yes, when you left the house, each of us were in shock. We went into our own recluse, reflected, 
and regretted our actions. That day, I won the battle without having to say a single word. No, Sun Zi Bing Fa. Bu dong zi dong, dong zi bu dong. Do not do, sometimes it's better than to do. Do not respond. It may give the other person a time to reflect, to reconcile differences, to come to realization of a better tomorrow, a better association. Okay. Again, is wisdom. I guess because I lost my bias, I become more wise. Sure. And you talk about the five W's as well. Could you share a bit more about that? Um, every situation, there are factors to be considered. So an easy formula for you to consider is how I make the best outcome it is dependent on who, what, where, when, why. Who are the people involved? What are the pertinent situations? Where is it? In Singapore, at home, in the workplace, in other countries, each place will have a different consideration. Where, when, where, why? For what purpose? Is it for religion, for faith, for personal, career, for money? Wait, who, what, where, when, why, and how? Yeah, correct. Right. So that's what, consider all these factors. It allows you to make a decision that is more grounded on mm -hmm. the fundamentals. Sure, and an elevated what? perspective, right? You share. Yeah. And yeah. not just um, elevated perspective on the fundamental. Mm. You are not doing things with airy fairy consideration mm. because that will cause you to do a lot of things in an erroneous way. It must okay. be factual. It must be tangible. It must have an effect on the outcome. Okay. Well, mm. and apart from, from this resilience, this cornerstone that you use, right? You navigate your life. What, uh, the, what also strikes me is you mentioned about how you're willing to able to accept certain situations mm. and let it go. I think a lot of people find find trouble with that, even myself, right? As we chase something, naturally there's an attachment. And you did do well, you did share with me if I if I could just share with the audience that initially when you first had your accident, uh your your then girlfriend she visited you of course in the hospital. And your best friend also visited you as well. Mm. And they eventually, they ended up together lah, eventually. And now they're married with kids. Mm. And initially, how, how did you feel? You, was it tough initially? And how did you then? I, I, was, I was confused. Okay. I was confused. Because to cling on to my girlfriend when I don't remember her as my girlfriend mm. will be a lie I have to live on with for the rest of my life. I understand. But I'll be losing an asset. So should I cheat my conscience and get an asset? I cannot. I cannot. I have to let her go. It's about learning to let go and not grieve about it. This is very important. Some people, they let go, but it stayed on to bug them for the rest of their life. And this, I believe, is their mistake. You must know how to let go and not let it impede your advancement in your new trail in life. Sure. Yeah. How can one do that though? It's so difficult. Even for me, I have trouble doing that. Possessions you have will not follow you to the grave. You cannot bring what you have with you when you leave the world. So why bicker, fight, quarrel, bring about disharmony because of these selfish traits. Yeah. Okay. I learned to live and let live. Okay. And I'm glad that my best friend is taking good care of my girlfriend. Mm. They are made for one another because their relationship has lasted all this while in the past mm. day. With me, my girlfriend would have suffered. Yeah. Mm. And my Progress, my recovery may be impeded because of my dependency. So mm. let go sets me free. And one important point I guess I need to talk about is after the accident, feedbacks 
caused me a lot of dismay and harm. So at that point of time, I meditated on it and I thought of a possible solution. That is to use sandpaper to rub my face until my skin is as thick as my foot. So I use this analogy and I closed my eyes. I reflected on it many a times mm. during my recovery phase. This helped me to create a mindset that becomes impregnable. So we have people criticizing me with those. Yeah. They need not say anything on the bus, on the MRT. Yeah, just you can see. I, yeah. Yeah, I would be calm and I'll smile. Can you imagine my right leg broke? And so I used the MRT as a form of therapy. I stand my body, my leg tilted about 30 degrees away from the direction of motion. And I bend my knee and I twiddle my butt to balance with my mm. hand on the MRT that is moving. So I don't okay. hold the rippling. Sure. The people seated will be all looking at me, oh, this guy is Xiao Wan. Mm. But I don't mind because they are not in my shoes. I am in my shoes. This is why I'm able to recover better and develop better balance. Yeah. Mm. Literally and metaphorically. Case management. So, yeah. yeah. So Lian Pi Ho sometimes is very helpful. Wow. Uh, that's a, that is that's probably the most striking analogy I've I've actually heard from someone using and you didn't you don't you don't actually do it right but the act of you thinking about it helps you to put that mental image in your brain now. And and you know what broke what changed that? There was yeah. a time when I attended a workshop and in the workshop they asked us participants to keep our eyes closed and look up and recall the time we hurt people who love us so much. Mm. With my eyes closed, and I saw my father looking at me, telling me, Son, don't worry, I'm somewhere safe. Upon hearing that, I crumbled into tears and I felt very small. But when I opened my eyes, wow, even managing director also crying. Mm. Oh, that brought a relief to me mm. that it's okay to be emotional, to cry, to lower your. That is why I guess. I learned to develop the maturity, know when to be detached, cold, aloof, or impregnable, and when to open myself to connect and feel with the community, for the community, for a better tomorrow. Ah, and that, that sums up the what Twitter user actually, the reference that he mentioned that he has zero, zero hate for God or for the world zero resentment about what life dealt you. And, and that actually just explained why you, you have this, you know, you just explain why, how you let go of all those and move forward with it. And just the last question on in this segment, right? what gives you purpose in the present? What gives you purpose in the present? You see, after my accident, I, I feel that I'm chosen to go through this journey. Mm -hmm. So that and be the lighter beacon in troubled water. That became my motivation to travel on. And no, you talk about impossible. I got F9 for my Mandarin, but yet my spoken Mandarin can be better than many people. It's about the will to and to make it happen. I listened to FM 93.3 but for one whole year. I bought a honey bean dictionary and I recited the, po um, the phonetics, Mandarin phonetics, I recited it to improve my ability to speak proper Mandarin. And I translated my poem from English, Against the Wind, to Ni Feng Le Xing. Wow, could you, could you share that? Let me recite to you. Yeah. Ye da la, ke shi xiang wei chen nie, fer fa xian zi ji wu fa bi mian du guo yi shen, Ni Feng Le Xing le nie, bu zhi he wei zhong shi yi fan lang chao, Fan when there's a will, there will be a way. With my broken leg, I can run the full marathon. With my dislocated shoulder, broken rib, 
I can swim butterfly style in a year. When there's a will, there will be a way. The choice is yours, every one of you. Learn to have an elevated view of the existential conditions, who are where and why, and find out how you can bridge the gap, whatever gap it may be that you're trying to clear. Because if you can do it well, a lot of people will respect you and honor you because you have them under your consideration. Oh, that is, I mean, I got emotional listening to you. I just feel like my struggles are so small. <laughs> um, but thank you uh, so much for just pouring your soul and being vulnerable with, with me and to the audience that are listening to this eventually. I think that I can't speak for everybody, but for me, I will always remember this. I will actually never forget this moment I spent with you and the things that you have actually shared. And I'm glad that I also have it recorded so that anytime I want to go back, I can go back to it. Yeah, so I, re I really want to meet you in person one day. And okay. I really hope that, that I can also provide opportunities for you to speak in schools because I know you did a couple of times. Um, I, I really just feel that you need a big audience. <laughs> um, this coming Friday, me and a few other brain jet people we are gathering at Tiong Baru Plaza. Okay. Plaza. Okay, I will text you. I'll check out. my calendar and I'll text you. But yeah, my word one day I will wanna meet you. I'll definitely meet you in person. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, before we conclude this podcast, uh, just one last segment. It's actually a Q and A segment, right? So it's a quick fire Q and A segment on your reflections and a bit of your resilience as well. Yeah, so I'm gonna ask yeah. you a couple of questions. You have about thirty to forty seconds per question to answer it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So the first question is, what is one secret ingredient to your resilience? When is the will, there'll be a way. A favorite quote or mantra? If it's to be, it's up to me. For anyone who feel like at their absolute lowest, what advice would you have for them to get through it? Take a deep breath. Use the diaphragm. Take a deep breath. Step back to consider the situations, who, what, where, and why. Calmly decide how each of the people are thinking and try to include everyone's consideration in formulation of the best solution. But remember, do not get personal, be detached to calmly suggest solutions in this kind of situations. If you could go back in time and change things, Will you do it? I will not. I accept the past as an experience. And because of the experience, I learn. And using what I've learned, it will help me make future decisions. If everybody go back to the past to change, there will be chaos. Mm. How do you let go of bitterness or resentment? Seeing the big picture helps me to let go of bitterness. It allows me to stand in the shoes of the older. It explains why people behave the way they do. I become rational. That makes it a logic-oriented decision. Okay. So I will not be bitter. I will not resent. Because I know the way they respond is because of their consideration. In our society, what do you wish to see us doing more? I wish to study becoming more compassionate, considerate, and elevated in their perspective, as well as inclusive for even the minority groups. Yeah. How can one love more abundantly? One can love more abundantly by reducing the I consideration. When you live for the community, the I become less important, mm. but you become, get, you become more powerful, empowered. Okay. Right now in my workplace, I actually have an ex-lecturer who come to volunteer for free. And during his volunteering time, he can share with us so many priceless knowledge. That is why being there in my workplace, I learn a great deal. Helping other people, I get to help myself because of these wonderful teachers. Okay. What? What is one message you have for youth? The 
world is in your hand. It is how you walk your trail that matters. Walking your trail implies living your life, associating with people, using what is available, and reading from yourself the negative thoughts, the selfishness, building up your integrity, your morale, sense of camaraderie with your peer for a common goal. There's a betterment of society. Okay. Last question. What, what do you want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered for mm -hmm. a lighted beacon in troubled water. I want people to, upon learning my experience, see their problem, their dilemma in a different light and hence are able to formulate solutions to resolve them or to lessen their negative impact. Uh, this will be great if I can be the lighted beacon. Okay. Thank you. That concludes our Q&A segment. Thank you, Takala. Uh, no doubt you've been a beacon of light to me. Absolutely no doubt. I, I can say that I've hosted so many podcasts, but this is among the top three that I, I'm just <laughs> impacted by. Yeah, Thank so... I, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure how to end this podcast. I mean, I just want to thank you again, once again, for sharing your story and your wisdom with all of us. You know, maybe one day I'll have you back if I have a studio. Maybe one day I can have you back and do a second podcast with you in person. Um, sure. But for the time being, I do wish you all the best. Thank um, you. Let's keep in touch. And if there's any opportunities, right, either for my own company or others, I will definitely let you know. Yeah. Mm. Um, do you have any last message you want to share with the audience? Or? Um, I just received a, a call from a lady today, I think from SGX. Okay. She's inviting me to speak to her group during lunchtime. Oh. And she, I, mean, I told her about this interview this evening. She would like her colleague to look at this interview. And ah. so they, when they get to see me, share my experience, as well as talk to me, they would be able to garner all the more. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Now we'll, we'll, we'll send it, I'll send it to you once I edit it. Uh, you can find Takala, I think, on, on Instagram. I know you're not very active there. You should be more active there. Maybe I'll help you out with your Instagram. Okay, sure. sure yeah, yeah. I'll help you out with Instagram. Uh, you know, and the certain wisdom you can just write down and then just post a picture along with it. It can just be a tree or even by yourself. I, I, will, I will talk to you about that. But for now, you can follow Takala on Instagram. I'll put the link there. You can follow him on Facebook as well. I've, Add him on Facebook. He has a Facebook account. And of course, you want to read more about his story, you can just Google adding mothership and some other. And my video, my video from Media Call. Uh, yes. Courage. Yeah, yeah for That's sure. Fine. Go and check it out. But this will probably be the most in depth, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Anyway, yes, thank you so much for tuning in, all of you. I hope you just subscribe if you want to uh, for future episodes. Uh, with that, stay authentic, stay resilient. And yeah, just remember that if there's a will, there's a way. Okay, okay, bye bye. Can say bye as well, Takala. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, see you all. Bye.